be going through three um, sets of topics as, um, as time allows. Uh, the first topic, which I thought we'd start to be a discussion of how any logic handles uh, stochastics within models and, and deals with, particularly for analyzing uh, stochastics, accumulates information across many runs of a model so that you can understand the variability but also the broad generalities that, that apply between those different realizations, those different runs of models with different random number seeds. So um, we're going to first uh, talk about that. I then am going to uh, probably go, as, depending on the time, I'll probably have a discussion of basics of Java, different types of statements within Java. We'll then go and uh, take a look at several models of uh, increasing sophistication which read in network data from a file and apply it within any logic. So uh, a couple lectures ago we had a lecture which focused on output of data and uh, getting data out of any logic models uh, is possible through a couple different routes. So we talked about the role of data sets, for example, and accumulating data. We talked about um, how you could write data out through data sets to, to files, how you could export it on an ad hoc basis, how you could create graphs, um, how you could use statistics to compute statistics over populations, etc. Um, in uh, the latter part of, of today's lectures, we're going to be looking at the reverse of these. How do you bring data in, in this case from a file, and impose it on network structure? Okay. So uh, there's uh, three different models that I created um, which illustrate this. They're actually the same model, but three different levels of sophistication in terms of um, bringing data in from files. And so we're going to be going over those in the latter section of, of today's lecture. Okay. Um, so first, uh, so while I'm doing this, I'd like, um, like those of you who have just come in to make sure that you go to the example models area of the website and download this example success of file-based network creation model. So it will be helpful if you do that now so you can hit the ground running when we, when we start this. Okay, it's the third one down in the example models area. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about stochastic processes and, and how any logic particularly allows us to analyze data collected from many realizations of an any logic model, many Monte Carlo uh, runs of an any logic model. Um, so um, there's many phenomena in the world that change over time which are approximated as stochastic processes, um, processes that involve randomness over time. Perhaps not pure randomness, perhaps there's some regularities, but there's variability um, uh, around those, those regularities. Examples would be stock market uh, fluctuations, rainfall, uh, oil prices, economic growth, if your model is, is of a smaller scale. These are phenomena which may impact the, the uh, the dynamics you're trying to capture, problems you're trying to address, but they're often outside our control and they're approximated, because they involve so much variability, they're approximated using some sort of uh, stochastic formulation. And uh, what's considered stochastic in a model depends, of course, on the scope of the model. So a model that's um, less detailed in, in one particular area may treat a lot of phenomena within that area as stochastic that would be broken out in much more detail in terms of their regularities, the underlying mechanisms in a more detailed model of that area. Um, so aspects of individual behavior might be treated as, as simply having random variability um, from a model which doesn't focus on that. But from a model which does, you might try to characterize what aspects of context <coughs> lead to that and more of the 
phenomenon that you treat stochastic in one model be treated as, as sort of mechanistic in another. Yeah. So bridging back to what we discussed on Friday, that, yeah. that would be an opportunity to, let's say, um, as opposed to treating, let's say, individual age behavior randomly, you, you could treat it as the development over time through a system dynamics model. Yes, yes. Um, that's right. So you could have individual behavior governed by some sort of regularities captured in a system dynamics model, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, examples might be from one model, you might treat individuals coming in um, into the hospital with uh, different levels of infection as just a matter of random variability. In another model, you might recognize that that patient population has those characteristics because of previous failures in delivering care to those individuals, and you might actually be interested in characterizing causes of those variabilities, or at least hypothesizing about it. So that might become part of the mechanistic sort of components of your model that you're trying to capture. And yeah. So, so for example, if, if, uh, if you had individuals coming into a hospital that weren't, for whatever reason, weren't being treated, but yep. were still sick, but were going back out yep. into the population, yep. then as opposed to it being, uh, you might actually you know, you probably be some kind of exponential growth in the arrival rate. Yes, that. yes, that's right. That's right, except if there's exponential growths in deaths rates yeah, or, yeah. or the, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, or if they go to another, they seek another care facility because yours is not offering adequate care, you know, preferentially because of poor treatment or whatever. But um, yes, you'd expect to see sort of uh, signs that there's some underlying feedbacks associated with it perhaps, which would lead you to suspect that this is not purely um, a stochastic phenomenon way outside your control and maybe actually due to something about your system, you know. Um, similarly, it may be that, you know, we didn't used to see that, that phenomenon, but now we do, what's changed, etc. Um, and, you know, uh, again, in terms of scope, uh, something like a meteorological model wouldn't treat rainfall as stochastics, whereas a model that focuses on <coughs> West Nile infection um, and is focusing on policy response, may treat weather and, and rainfall effects as more or less stochastically. Um, so stochastics are an important feature of modeling. They're a prominent feature when it comes to use of any logic in multiple of its forms. And I particularly highlight the age-based model and discrete event models with any logic, within any logic as having prominent stochastic features. Um, so notably, uh, with agent-based modeling, uh, transitions between states in a state chart, the firing of, of certain events which are occurring at a rate, um, the handling of messages, for example, whether someone is infected by a message that's sent to them, um, might be stochastic. In a discrete event model, such as we looked at last time, um, there are many phenomena that are treated stochastically explicitly, and an example would be the duration of a procedure, how long it takes to be delivered care to, uh, to address your ailment might be tried, treated as a drawing from a triangular distribution or a normal distribution or what have you. Um, so normally, because of this, there's considerable variability in the results of a model from simulation to simulation, even given the exact same inputs, there's going to be tremendous variability often. Tremendous, uh, perhaps overstating, there's going to be variability. Um, so uh, operationally, um, this matters because we want to gain confidence in our understanding of model results. We want to gain confidence that we understand the, the broad um, uh, sort of outputs of the model and how they change over the time. And to do that, we often need to run a so-called ensemble of realizations. Um, more than one run of a model so that we can see the commonalities between those runs. So we can see the differences between those runs. And we're going here from the province of, of um, just looking at one trajectory to instead looking statistically at the results of a model. We're going to be dealing with 
mean standard deviations, empirical fractiles, uh, say around the median, as compared to just you know a single trajectory as you might get out of uh, the classic stock and flow model. Um, this is not to say there's no regularities. There's tremendous <coughs> regularities you may see from run to run. It's just there's variability about those regularities. And, and it matters how much variability there is. It matters how much, um, uh, how much variation there is in terms of the impact of your, say, the, the differential trade-off between interventions. So maybe uh, intervention A is better than intervention B in most cases, but sometimes it's terrible compared to intervention B. Um, so we need to reason over a, of a population or ensemble of realizations, an ensemble of, of runs of the model. And, and statistics become a key tool here as they deal with dealing with variability more generally. So we're going to be um, uh, looking here both in the um, looking at, at intervention outcomes, looking at calibration, looking at sensitivity analysis results, statistical, uh, statistical statements regarding the output. Um, we might look, for example, in calibration at the fractile of the model's outputs in which historic data falls. Um, we're not trying to say how close is model output to the historic value um, in a deterministic way, but um, how consistent is the variability, given the variability we see coming out of the model, how consistent is the historic data in light of that? So we're dealing with things that are dealt with by p-values, for example, traditionally, et cetera. We could probably bring one of those up here if there's a need, like swing them around. I don't mean to crush everyone in the, in the back. Um, and we might look at mean differences and results between interventions or look at a whole histogram of the difference in the gains between two interventions. Um, so for those folks who just came in, um, while I'm talking, because I want to spend some time on it uh, in the later part, I'd ask you to go to, so first of all, <coughs> the lecture that I'm presenting now is on the website. But if you could go and download from the example models in the Stellar site, um, I posted a, a model, uh, three models of file-based network creation that show uh, ways of creating network structures from files, and we're going to be going through them in the later part of today's lecture. So I'd like you to download that while I'm talking so we can go pretty quickly to that, okay? Um, okay, so in short, we have to deal with variability, and we have to make statements uh, statistically that, um, that are well-founded in light of that variability. So um, the main way of dealing with this is through Monte Carlo analysis, um, and any logic provides uh, tools for performing Monte Carlo simulations. In other words, running the model again and again and again with different random number seeds where the results are different each time. Um, and uh, any logic provides ways not only of running those but of displaying the results. One way to display the results, which you can, uh, which you can do in many packages, is to simply display each trajectory over time. And in fact, you could do this in any logic. You simply um, could show, for example, the output as an output variable the number of people who are sick in the population over time, um, and you could run the model many, many times and see many trajectories. The problem is that quickly gets messy, and what you don't see is the clustering of certain trajectories atop each other because they're kind of hiding each other. So any logic provides um, a tool that's classically used to deal with this um, a histogram but provides it in a two-dimensional sort of way. Two-dimensional because you have the histogram providing um, a statement, a summary over time, and within each uh, sort of interval of time, giving you a histogram for that interval of time where the trajectories fell, okay? A histogram so that it can help alert you to some regions which have lots and lots of trajectories falling on, falling on them and some regions which are very so the Monte Carlo 2D histogram that we'll be encountering here in just a moment divides up time and histogram bins. Both of them are quantized into, into chunks, into discrete intervals. Okay? So time 
time is divided up into a set of intervals, and then we divide up um, the, the vertical axis, as it were, um, uh, the, the, the bins, the categorization of the bins, um, as well. So time is, um, is divided up, uh, you can think of it as along the horizontal time axis, and then there's a value axis that's associated with the quantity being displayed. And even if it's continuous, we divide it up into chunks, so we can <coughs> state you know, what fraction fell within this range, or this range, or this range. Um, and this is a set of divisions along the, the vertical axis um, as it's shown. And together they define a, a uniform grid. Uniform not in the sense that the, the x and y divisions have to be the same, but in the sense that it's throughout it, you have the same sort of uh, divisions. So the divisions at time x are the same as the divisions at time y in terms of um, so we're gonna, there's a set of cells on this grid that, that have to do with a certain time point, what, how many values fell within a certain range of, of, of values. How many trajectories fell within a certain range of values. Okay, um, and the 2D histogram helps us understand basically uh, the regularities between and variability between trajectories over time. So I'd like to see this. I'd like you to load in the model called SIR agent-based calibration. We've seen this in other cases. It's one of the AnyLogic sample models. And um, uh, to see it, you can go to the example models, and it should be uh, featured there. So uh, SIR, it's not SIR agent-based. It's SIR agent-based calibration. Okay, And we're going to be coming back to this uh, model uh, in a uh, further lecture probably this week on sensitivity analysis and then to a subsequent le uh, lecture probably two weeks from now on calibration. Okay, so uh, what we see here is a model which um, has main and, and, and agent classes on it, so it's familiar in that context, but it has a Monte Carlo 2D histogram and if you double click on that Monte uh, Carlo 2D histogram you'll see a sort of uh, uh, curious uh, presentation uh, in front of you. Okay, so um, what we're going to take a look at is um, how the Monte Carlo analysis uh, takes place, how we accumulate those values, um, and uh, how they're summarized within the, uh, within the chart. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to click on uh, first here is the um, the 2D histogram itself. So uh, let me go over here, and uh, it's it's um, it's going to be first click uh, click on this chart here, um, which you'll you'll see on the the right hand side. It's the most obvious thing, and you'll notice there's uh, several choices here. One is show envelopes and show bins, and I'm going to try to um, uh, try to express the difference between those two. And you'll notice it also says, okay, where, what's the source of the histogram data? And it says data infectious 2D, okay? So if we uh, pull down over here within the, uh, within the project, we can go see um, data infectious 2D. And this is a, a histogram. It's a, it's a data set, but it's a histogram data set. And it's going to define a set of horizontal intervals, that is intervals for time in this case, and vertical intervals, um, intervals associated with, with value. Okay, for now though, I'd like you to go and just click on, so we're gonna return to those, click on this um, experiment as a whole, okay? Sorry? What were the intervals? Oh, okay, the intervals were with, with respect to this uh, down here. So if you go, um, there's two distinct things uh, here. One is the Monte Carlo 2D histogram chart. And the second thing is the 2D histogram data set. And that's under analysis data here within this experiment because it's being accumulated, it turns out, within the experiment uh, data structures. And that's what specifies the bins uh, as they apply both over time and over value dimension. Okay. Um, okay, 
But for now, as I said, I'd like you to go focus on this guy here, which is the, uh, uh, the experiment associated with this. And you'll notice it's a parameter variation experiment. Um, however, we can use this experiment absent any par parameter variation just to observe the variability that results through stochastics. If we don't change any parameters running it again and again and again, uh, what sort of variability do we still see? Now, there's, there's a couple things you'll see here. Um, one thing is uh, there's a selection here in terms of random number generation uh, or whether you want a random seed or a fixed seed. Um, if you're just going to run it with no variability in, um, in the uh, parameters uh, at all, you're typically going to want a random seed because you want to examine variability with, with respect to the stochastics. The second thing you'll see is that down here in parameters, you can either specify to vary them within some ranges or to specify them um, as being drawn from, a, from some expression. And all the expressions right now are deterministic, okay? Um, they give fixed values to these parameters. We'll come back to this. Um, I'd like you right now to run this, okay? So uh, we'll run it by, by right-clicking on it and um, get up. And uh, you notice it says run 100 replications with this uh, button in the upper right. So we're going to run 100 replications. And what it's doing is it's running the model again and again and again. This is an SIR model. And uh, the model is exhibiting some variability to the, uh, the different runs. So within, at a given time, you don't just have a single trajectory, you know, uh, a trajectory that leads to a single bin vertically for that point in time. Let's say time 40. 40 plus some delta t. Uh, if it were just a single trajectory, totally deterministic, we'd expect that trajectory to go through a single bin along the bin. Instead, we see some variability along the bins. And as we'll see, um, you can specify uh, the conventions used for displaying this variability. Okay. So we're, we're getting up to 200. Um, we've done 200 runs here. And we've seen uh, that there's some variability. You'll notice that there's some realizations which are even down here, where the infection never takes off in the first place. Uh, presumably, those first couple people didn't end up spreading it to anyone else. And uh, the, the infection, uh, the population stayed in this unstable endemic, or this unstable disease free equilibrium after that. Um, but there is some variability. Um, it's not terribly much, but there's some some cases, for example, where you know um, at this well, let's let's take time 40. You can see there's one way up here, and the minimum uh, goes down to about here or so. So uh, this is variability from stochastics alone. No variation in these parameter values. These are the parameters here for the model. All there is is variability associated with the vagaries of who happens to get infected by who and, and uh, by whom and who sends a message to whom, um, uh, how long it takes for someone to recover, whether they recover quickly or it takes a long time. Yeah. Well. Okay. So let's um, let me explain that uh, uh, better here. So if, if I run this again, the x-axis here is time. So uh, as we saw just a couple times ago when we created our own charts, maybe it was just one or two times ago, two times ago, um, we had charts which went out over time. But those charts were displaying data from a single run of the anti-logic model. This is displaying data from multiple runs of the anti-logic model, multiple realizations. We're, we're up to realization 91 here. And the vertical axis is specifying so if, if we consider, um, uh, say, uh, a certain time interval here between 40 and 40 plus, this is probably 40, 42, um, right out here. The vertical axis here is going to be counting the number of runs that fell within, which had this many infected people at this time, or this many infected people, this many. Now each of these, each of these cells corresponds, therefore, to for a particular interval of time. What, what uh, did what number of trajectories encountered 
within a certain interval in terms of the number of people infected at that time. Does that make sense? So imagine that we ran this out. Imagine one of these trajectories, um, the first of the trajectories had no one infected at that time. It would, it would increase, it would, it would lead to one being counted in this cell down here. Suppose the next, next trajectory had 1,000 um, at that time, or an average <coughs> of, uh, over that time interval of 1,000. You'd increase this by one. Yes, you could think of this as kind of scratching out over time successive trajectories. And it's asking in the color here, the brightness of the color shows how deeply has it been etched. Because, you know, if, if certain trajectories go again and again over certain of these bins, that histogram is going to be uh, larger there. To put it another way, maybe this will help. If we think of a certain interval in time here, and that's an that's a histogram. So, you know, I think uh, most of you have seen histograms before. A histogram will, will display, you know, the count of, of observed cases which fall within certain ranges. And if, you know, if it's discrete, I'm exaggerating here. It's an approximation to a distribution, but we'll maybe we'll have this many exactly, this many exactly, this many exactly, that fell, that were encountered as lying within a certain range. So we could have a histogram, and this, this diagram here is essentially has histograms for each of these intervals of time. And that's what that 2D histogram is accumulating. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you were to take this and sort of flip it, you can imagine a histogram sort of being fairly high here, then going down to zero, right? Um, being close to zero here and then sort of coming up and then going down. And the, the darkness of the color is an indication of how the, the, the um, magnitude of the uh, histogram at that point or at that interval. Does that make sense? OK. So 2D histogram, it's a little bit misleading because really it's a set of histograms over time. Um, you're not doing histograms in the, in the um, time dimension as well. The histograms are in the value dimension. They're just being applied you know, over time. OK? Make sense? OK. So even without uh, parameter variation, there can be um, substantial variability. I'd like to go check how it's accumulating this data. So what I'd like you to go look at here is the, the data set called Data Infectious 2D. And as is common for any logic sample models, it's hidden over here to the left-hand side. But we can also access it through this hierarchy here. And you'll notice um, that it's specifying a set of relevant data to, uh, for, for how to, how to uh, accumulate, accumulate this information. This is stating, OK, what are the bins? So what are the vertical intervals? And it says there are 40 of them from 0 to 8,000. So in other words, the upper end of the histograms that's accumulating are, are in 8,000, um, up at 8,000. And the minimum is 0. And there's 40 such bins being accumulated. And in terms of horizontal intervals here, time intervals, there's 80 of them from 0 to, to 200, time, time 200. Um, and then it's further asking about the envelopes. And as we'll see, what we're really summarizing here is, um, in, in that particular demonstration, is the envelopes rather than the bins themselves. I'm going to double check on that. Um, let, me, let me just confirm my statement there. Ah, no, this is bins. OK, envelopes would be another option. So if we were showing envelopes, we would use uh, the empirical fractiles just, uh, just shown. In other words, we'd have an envelope, um, uh, a 50% empirical fractal envelope around the median, a, uh, and, and one showing uh, 25%, 75%. In other words, we'd have envelopes around the median value, the value above which 50% of the trajectories fall and below which 50% of the trajectories fall at that given point in time. Um, we would have envelopes 
that include 50% of the values, 25% of the values, and 75% of the values. Okay, so in other words, um, if we consider it for a given uh, point in time, and we have uh, trajectories falling there, we'd be showing envelopes around the median, and maybe the median is, is here, suppose, which contain 25% of the values, so maybe 25% of all the values fall within this range, within 50% uh, of the values, maybe 50% fall within this range here, and 75%, so maybe 75% fall within this range here. Um, so we'd be illustrating those, those uh, envelopes around the median if we were showing histogram envelopes. Here we're showing actually histogram bins. We're actually showing the number that fall within each of those. Um, or we're, we're just encoding that with the, um, with the graphics. So there's two things here. This is defining what data to accumulate. There's a chart which is stating what data to display given that accumulation, whether to show the envelopes or show the bins. So let's go over to the chart for a second and let's just do show envelopes just, just so we can see what that would look like for the same run. So I'd like you to again run this thing um, and uh, we're going to see, okay, so here are the envelopes. Envelopes look different. So these are again envelopes around the median in which 25%, 50%, and 75% of all values fall. And what you'll see is that everything within this region is in fact within some envelope. That's because if you consider where 75% of the runs lie, oh, okay, so no, no longer is it the case that 75% of the runs you needed to go all the way down to here to reach to include 75% of the runs. Now 75% are within this range. There's some runs that are down here, but those are outliers. Um, uh, they're not within the sort of central 75th percentile uh, around the median. Okay, so this is this is now the um, the envelopes, and you can define your own envelopes. If you're interested in a 90% envelope, that might extend all the way down to here, for example. Here we're looking at 75%. That's the lightest color, and uh, 50% and 25%, which is the darkest color. So, so those are envelopes we've used. All we've done is we're accumulating the same data. We're simply, um, simply displaying a different property of it. We're showing envelopes rather than showing bins. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, can I show you that in just a sec? I'm going to be tracing through the logic for this. Um, okay, um, so I'll be showing how this model works in terms of accumulating this data in just a minute here. Okay, um, I want to introduce uh, a bit of terminology be, uh, partly because when we look at how it's accumulating this information, you'll see this terminology used, and I don't want you to be thrown off too much by it. There's three terms that any logic uses, experiment, simulation, and replication. Uh, I don't like these terms being used. I think there's better terms in the literature, but it's what we've got to work with. So uh, I'll introduce them. A replication is a single run of the model. I would call it a realization of the model. It's a single run of the model with some particular random number C. Right? A simulation is in general a collection of replications. Uh, that can yield findings across a set of applications. Like maybe we want to do a, a simulation that includes multiple realizations to compute the mean value across those realizations, so the mean fit to some historic data. And then you can have an experiment, which is a collection of simulations. Okay? Um, so we have this experiment we've been running, which has had run many, many simulations. Okay. Um, and uh, the thing that's um, a little bit confusing here is many models don't exercise this. So in many models we've been running, 
experiment has a single simulation in it and there's a single replication. So we've been running a model one time and that's within an experiment and it's a single simulation um, that, that runs uh, a single realization of the model. And even any logic models which run ensembles of realizations, a simulation is often composed of only a single realization. We just run many, many simulations. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit confusing. You gotta, you gotta be careful about um, how it's using the, the terminology. Okay, so not always. Uh, oh, sorry, realization, replication, the same thing. Yes, yes. Realization, replication, the same thing. When I say realization, I'm talking about a single run of the model with a single uh, random number C, okay? Um, but that's not a term you'll see in any logic a lot. It, you'll see replication as more or less the synonym for it. Um, okay, so where does this data come from? How do we know that this data that we've been looking at have anything to do with infectious individuals? Well, um, one place to start is to go look at this parameter variation experiment and see how, where the data that's in this data infectious 2D data set, this data set that's accumulating this data with a certain number of bins and so on, where is that coming from? If you go look at the data set itself, and you, you folks don't have to do it, it's just, I'm going to illustrate. If you go look there, we just saw it, and there's no indication of where it comes from. It doesn't, there's no horizontal axis value, vertical axis value. You can actually define those but um, the way in which this, this particular model is set up, you, you don't see where those are coming from. It's almost by magic. Okay, so where is that stored? Well, it turns out if you go to the histogram itself and you go to advanced, um, what you'll see is there's, there's places, handlers, where you can put instructions to accumulate this data. What this is saying is after each simulation, Take the data from the main, um, the main class in the data set called infectious DS and put it into data infectious 2D, okay? So this data set here is in main, okay? This, and if, after every realization, after every simulation here, which is just consisting of some one replication, you're taking the data from this infectious data set and you're putting it and you're storing it away, you're adding it to the set of data being accumulated by this 2D histogram data set. Okay. So that's where the data within that are coming from. And if we go up to main, um, we can go see where this DS infectious is. You go up to here and that you'll see there's this infectious DS uh, data infectious DS and um, uh, excuse me that is the chart I want to look at the uh, no this is excuse me um, so the vertical axis data for this data set is N infectious which is the count of infectious people so this is accumulating the count of infectious people within Maine and after every simulation of this it's, in other words, after we run each run there, it's taking that data from that run and putting it into, from that data set in main, and putting it into this histogram data set and accumulating that, accumulating. In other words, this is how it's accumulating memory of run after run after run so that it can show you those statistics across all runs. That's how it can show you multiple run information at a single time. It's because of that right there, okay? Um, so this is where it's accumulating. And you'll notice, it says before each experiment run. In other words, before, um, if I were to go like this, um, if I were to run this again, <coughs> if I were to run this uh, once, uh, and, and I were to finish it, and then I were to restart it, I don't think I'll wait all the way, and I were to run it again, it gets cleared. Why is it getting cleared there when I press that? Well, it's uh, it's what you see with the reset there. Um, so let's let's go up here um, where it says data infectious 2D reset. 
So that's resetting. Before each experiment run, it resets all the data. It throws away all, any data that was there previously. So that's this component here. So these, these are the two components. Yeah. So what you're saying is um, every simulation yeah. every, uh, yeah, before, no, before every experiment, um, it, which is going to run multiple simulations, it, it empties out this 2D histogram data set. Flushes it. Correct. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And in fact, you can read out the data in the 2D histogram and put that to disk, for example. Now, that is going to have statistics on how many trajectories fall within each bin. What you don't see from that is uh, you don't you don't get to longitudinally follow a given trajectory over time. You don't know if the one that fell, you know, uh, if the one that fell, um, if the one that was down, may maybe the trajectory that was the lowest one here became the highest here, for example. You can't tell that through the data, the data, uh, the two D histogram data set. It's just a given the number that fall within each band, and it doesn't. It's kind of cross-sectional. It doesn't pay attention to, you know, if it was the same trajectory. If you want to do each trajectory, we put it into a database. And then you can summarize data up the wazoo about them. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so um, we, we saw the choice between envelopes, envelopes around the median, uh, versus the counts, looking at, at the counts, okay? Um, so these are, these are rather different. Um, the empirical fractals, as they're called, these, these sort of percentiles around the median, um, uh, have well-defined means. So 25 means boundary between lowest and second lowest quartile, for example, um, uh, and 50%. Um, so these are uh, right. So these define envelopes or contours uh, within rich data from different percentages of realizations fall. Uh, a slice through the output at a particular moment in time will be like an extended box plot um, showing, showing fractals. Um, the empirical fractals to use are themselves defined in the, in the 2D histogram data set object. So when you're specifying the 2D data set, you'll recall, you specify these envelopes here. Now, this states here, and I'm going to have to check my memory a bit. My recollection was that um, that what it was actually uh, that this is actually indicating the envelopes around. So 20.25 means the envelope within which 25% of the cases will fall around the median, etc. In my notes here on the slides, um, it, it it says actually its boundary between the lowest and the second lowest as to where it draws it. I believe my memory is correct. I'll have to double check this stuff. I'll see if I can correct the slides if it's off. Um, okay, um, right. So uh, this is the show envelopes. Um, so if we were to slice this, if we had the show envelopes mode on and we were to slice it at a point in time, you'd see something like a box plot. So the box plot showing traditionally the very minimum value or maximum value received, and this would be the 25th percent, perhaps <coughs> the 75th percent, and then in the, show, in the middle, it could show the median, for example. Sometimes you see it with the mean and the median. Um, what's not shown here are the whiskers, unless 100% fractals are specified. Um, and, uh, and here, the, the histogram 2D chart can show arbitrarily many envelopes, not just quartiles, not just max and min. Um, and median, it can show arbitrary fractals. Um, so if we do bins, we get something more like this. So this is an example where you see the real difference between the two. Here, you see sort of a box plot-like thing. You see that most cluster, you know, uh, the largest number cluster in here, and then this is the full, um, if, if you have 100%, this is the full width, 100% um, fractals. And then you get sort of decreasing out from the center centered around the median. But if you actually were to plot it out and show bins, what you might recognize is, in fact, it's bimodal. You, you in fact, have 
it's true that that uh, you know smaller and smaller fractions are included uh, further you go up here, but in fact around the, the center you're going to have you're going to have a situation where it actually the, the probability of being in this range rises. It's true as you go out from the center, the cumulative fraction that are within your integral as you go out gets larger and larger and larger. Hence, it was strictly monotonically decreasing in that previous one. In other words, um, the the fraction that lie within there, even if it's bimodal, if you consider the median right around the median, you're going to have a very small fraction included, right? If you consider right around the median, very small fraction is included within the envelope. The further out you go, the larger and larger fraction that's included, even if it's bimodal. But it obscures the fact that it is bimodal. Here you, you capture the fact that it's bimodal. And I crudely tried to draw sort of what it might look like if you were to slice it and consider the histogram though, there, right? Um, so this is, this is the show bins, and this can show multiple modes, which can be useful. It again does not tell you, you know, whether the thing that was in this upper mode here is was previously in this lower mode here. That's all kind of obscured. Um, so in other words, there's no longitudinal capacity to sort of recognize whether a trajectory went from down here and and went uh, up to there. But what you can see is that there are multiple modes, and of course that data is built up at a particular trajectory. Okay, um, so we've seen some aspects of how this data is accumulated. So basically, you have one of these um, one of these bins, and uh, this bin. Uh, in order to to get data into the bin, you simply tell it to dump this data in periodically from a from a data set that you've already been accumulating, and it just stores it away. Um, stores uh, bin information away uh, to allow for reconstruction of the 2D histogram. Um, this is the information from a single run, and it just increases, you know, increments the bins accordingly when you dump it in there. However, um, we have thus far not really taken a look at how many times this thing is run, um, what's, what's controlling it. And I'd like to go look at that. So if we go look at Monte Carlo 2D histogram, the experiment, what you'll see right now is that the number of runs is specified. It says 200, even though the interface said run 100. Okay, um, uh, it's 200 runs here. If you want to make it consistent, you can change it to 100. Um, uh, so this is the number of runs that it's doing. And, and uh, that's fine if, if um, you want to specify some fixed numbers of runs. But in some cases, what you may be interested in is, is um, having some uh, certain level of, of uh, precision in terms of the statistical uh, power of the results. So um, you folks remember, I don't want to go into the statistics on this too much because we have a lot to, to capture in today's course, but um, today's session. But um, you recall that if you take a sample mean of n samples, they vary independently around the mean. So if we take we have n samples of something, um, maybe it's n samples from n different trajectories, each of which gave a different value for a, a certain point in time, um, and we take the sample mean of those. Uh, if the samples x and y are independent, then the variance of x and y is, is going to add up. So if we have n independent samples here um, from a distribution, generally the, the variance of the sum is, is going to be the sum of the variance, and if they're from the same distribution, it be n times, times the variance. The standard deviation will be going up as square root of n times the standard deviation of, of x. Um, standard deviation being the square root of variance. Um, if we scale a random variable by factor alpha, um, then the standard deviation squares, uh, scales by the same factor, and so the variance scales by, by alpha squared. Okay, um, if you go through the necessary math, you consider the sample mean, and you consider variability in the sample mean, um, or the variance associated with the sample mean, as defined up there. What you get is the sample mean um, 
a variance in the sample mean is the variance of the variable whose, being, whose mean is being taken divided by n, the number of samples there. And so the standard deviation is what this is saying for the estimate of the, of the underlying mean. The, the, the standard deviation associated with the sample mean is going down by the square root of n. So the long and short of this is if we wish to divide standard deviation, the estimate, the precision of the estimate of the standard sample mean by a factor of two, we need to take four times the number of Monte Carlo samples. Okay, so if we're trying to estimate, say, the mean trajectory, and we're trying to do so using many, many runs of our model, the precision of our estimate goes up by a factor of two. The, the, the width of our error bars measured in terms of sort of standard deviation um, is, is, is halved. We get uh, tighter error, error bars by a factor of two if we take four times the number of samples. Okay. So we have to go, say, from 100 to 400 uh, runs of this model to have twice as, as precise an estimate of the sample mean. Okay, so what we're going to see is that any logic, and this is going to be the subject of the lecture, um, probably going to be Friday, it may be, uh, maybe uh, two weeks from today, um, where we are, uh, where we look at any logic's automatic throttling, okay? Um, I also want to draw attention to a closing question, which is um, here we're talking often about making decisions in an environment that changes over time, where changes could come because of stochastic variability and uncertainty regarding parameter values. And there's an incredibly large array of number of possible policies to deal with changes over time that are unexpected. And we're going to later in this course see a way to integrate decision analysis and simulations so that you can deal with decision making over time in the presence of variability, in the presence of uncertainty about um, how things will evolve in the world, um, about the efficacy of the interventions you've undertaken already, et cetera. And so you can have adaptive policies, policies which change in response to learning about the world, to new information that's come in. Um, you can hone your policies, and we'll we'll see how to do that. Now, is that yeah. Real time as the model progresses, and so, or is it something that you're going to take that insight and say at a certain time step, evaluate this, right. and then change the policy accordingly? Uh, uh, it's a good question. So um, there, there's two different uh, issues. I mean, one issue is in terms of deducing the policy. Um, there is a way of trying to adapt live, so to speak, your understanding of the situation uh, as you observe things about the world. So the, you, you feel the model may be getting off from its depiction of the world and will correct for that, which may allow you to make better policies because of that. And if, if we have time in this course, we'll take a look at a way of doing that. Um, there's one technique known as Kalman filtering. There's another technique known as uh, as uh, sequential Monte Carlo methods. But there's another, there's another technique um, which is based on, look, if we have a model that's of the sort we've been working with, the simulation model, and we have some sort of uh, uh, decision tree that we could formulate in terms of uh, uh, choices, in terms of possible uncertain events and outcomes, we could try to derive what a robust, um, as it's called, decision rule or strategy would be. So if we see this, what to do now? If we see that, what to do now? If we see this other thing, what to do now? So you know, um, we're applying it, for example, for West Nile infection. Um, if you see by this point in time more than a certain number of mosquitoes and the temperature is above such and such, you know, you should issue advisories, or at this point in time, um, you know, you should you should undertake biological control measures, or what have you, if you see these indications. And it's using the simulation model to go ahead and project forward, so that you it you have a sense of okay, if I do do this now, or if I don't, sort of what's the trade-off there, and you take that into account in your decision making. So the decision 
the, the simulation model is used as a tool to, to uh, complement any new data coming in and to, take, to, to evaluate the implications of that data looking forward. And you can then make, make decisions that take into account new data. You weren't sure what it was going to be. Now you know. As well as taking into account the knowledge built up in the, in the simulation model. Yes, that's and then right. You're taking, and then you said, and then you're building a decision tree based upon that. You're, uh, it, you can build the decision tree, yes, based on the, upon that information. Sometimes you may know about exogenous things that don't require running the, the simulation model, but yeah. And then, so, and then real time, you would take those, the, the association with those outcomes. Yeah. After seeing things, then you would just branch off yes. accordingly, but then you would also be updating. That's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, we'll talk more about this in some of its variations in a later lecture, okay? But um, so this is a brief introduction to stochastics. We're going to come back, um, and depending how our discussion goes, we may be able to do it today.